everyone. My name is Paolo Blickstein, and I'm a professor at Columbia University in New York City in the United States. And in this video, we want to talk about the maker movement and maker education, and we'll focus on practical principles that can be used by educators to integrate maker education in their classroom. So maker education is about creating and making and building, and it puts agency and student interest at the center, focusing on learning that is project-based and that makes learners more aware of how things work in the world and how the world is designed. And students see themselves as capable of tinkering, hacking, building things and improving designs. And this means something very important. They, can, they feel that they can actually impact the world by changing stuff around them and improving their lives and the lives of others. And in this process, of course, they learn a lot of new things. Maker education involves hands-on learning, of course, but it also involves minds in learning. So it's about both building and reflecting on what you build. It uses open-ended pedagogies to emphasize inquiry thinking, experiments, project design, and students in this way can use everyday physical materials or digital software or digital fabrication equipment to experiment, build, and test their ideas. Sometimes these ideas will fail, but that's okay. Errors actually provide an opportunity for reflection as long as students correct their mistakes and continue to improve their designs and their projects. And in this iterative way, students learn and grow in their understanding of different kinds of concepts, especially in the STEM disciplines. And this idea was actually uh, based on constructionism. So maker education is very much inspired by constructionism, which is a learning theory developed by Seymour Papert and many other collaborators, such as Edith Ackerman, Cynthia Solomon, uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, especially at MIT. And those uh, scholars were inspired by uh, Jean Piaget and his theories, and they all believe that children construct their own knowledge by building and refining things in the world. They build something, they share with peers, they test in the real world, and they refine both their objects and their ideas about how the world works. And to do that, they can use many kinds of materials, uh, physical materials like blocks, textiles, robotic kits, and now, there are many other kinds of classes of materials that are being introduced into maker education that are uh, enlarging and, and making it much more uh, inclusive and diverse. And there are four big roots or, or forces in the world that uh, put maker education into the mainstream of schooling. The first one is uh, the workforce and the realities of today's world. So nowadays, the workforce and life in general requires much more critical and creative thinkers. Routine jobs are more and more automated, so people need to think dynamically and adapt to various needs and various kinds of new situations that sometimes were not there when they were in school. So. The problem is that schools continue to push students to follow these very routinized, scripted tasks, rote learning, and that reduces, of course, their ability to be creative, to think outside of, to think outside of the box, to apply new ideas, and to think differently. The second thing is pedagogy. So the current pedagogy at schools, as I just said, is mostly what we call instructionist. So students sit, sit behind a desk, a desk and teachers transmit their knowledge uh, unidirectionally. So um, this kind of uh, unidirection transmission pedagogy doesn't work that well anymore. So new pedagogies like constructionism were born out of a critique of this kind of uh, approach. And a lot of educational research on it actually shows that students learn better and engage more with learning when they are doing, they're making, they're working in projects, and they're doing things that are meaningful to them. Another important force be behind the popularization of maker education are the tools. So tools like laser cutters and 3D printers, 20 years ago would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and would be you know, very big, very difficult to operate, and they were mostly found in industry. 
But over the last 15 years, those machines became much more affordable, much easier to use, much smaller, and suddenly they became something schools could actually afford. And those tools, those very powerful tools, uh, were suddenly in the hands of students. Uh, and that, that's, you know, a, a huge change that came from the kind of popularization of those tools. However, you know, we know that there was still a long way to go to make those uh, tools actually democratically present in every school and accessible to every student. But still, there was a lot that has been done in the last 15 years to popularize those tools. So now they, they can fit into a room in a school and they can fit into the budget of many schools. Another issue is culture. So even though the ideas behind maker education are not new, many high profile initiatives made it more part of the culture and move from a relatively small thing to a mainstream phenomenon. For example, Fab Labs created at MIT in the early 2000s are one of the makers movement uh, crucial roots. And as well as the Make magazine and the Maker Fair, which came along in 2005 and also became very big. Uh, other organizations such as Code.org helped popularize uh, coding. Uh, and this happened around the 2010s. And academia was also part of it. So uh, for example, FabLearn, the first academic initiative on maker education, came along in 2010 and was part of this process. And also work done by many researchers from many different communities, for example, the interaction designed for children, the computer human interaction, and also the learning sciences communities. And more recently, many researchers are calling for maker education to move away from its roots in tech and in the Silicon Valley and embrace a more diverse and inclusive uh, kind of culture and practices and there is still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and that's a really important issue to further democratize maker education. A core component of making is empowering students to create something meaningful and to see the impact of their work in the world around them. When you commit to making as a learning approach for all students, we must also prepare teachers and, ed and educators to promote some things that might be actually uncomfortable for many in education, such as risk-taking, independence, creativity, persistence, teamwork, collaboration, and also this process of reflection when you work through challenges. Implementing maker education is not just about a mindset or a space or materials or tools. It's actually a combination of pedagogies, materials, and good facilitation and curricular design. So all of those things need to be there working together. Maker education can be used in various ways and projects can be adjusted in scale and scope to meet individual class needs or student needs. For example, you can use sometimes cardboard and craft material, or sometimes you can use digital tools such as 3D printers and laser cutters. It depends on your resources, your goals, uh, your infrastructure, and there's a wide range of materials that you can use. But the key to successful maker education is really designing activities in which students are actively building knowledge, actively engaged, and have space to create. You, you know, for example, you can create a very instructionist maker activity if everything is scripted and students are just following instructions, even if they are using amazing materials. Also, uh, if you do not have materials that are flexible, generative and interesting, it could be really hard for students to create compelling projects. So it's not that materials have to be expensive, but they should be generative and flexible. So even though maker uh, ped pedagogy has many benefits and recommendations uh, to be implemented in schools, there are also many challenges. So one of them is what we call the keychain phenomenon. So often um, maker education 
is misused in schools in a way that students are just building identical, very simple projects like keychains or name tags instead of objects that actually give students more space to create. Another obstacle is that many educators see those activities as a nice to have, units that are fun but do not actually have any learning in them. Another obstacle is that teaching with making isn't linear and the process can be very messy. And so students need time and space uh, to create meaningful projects, but sometimes it doesn't look like the very organized, uh, clean, linear process that we are used uh, in schools. Also making is complex and there's still lots of points of failure and frustration. And sometimes we have trouble dealing with that. And finally, uh, another challenge, a fifth challenge, is that teachers need good professional development and training. Uh, and this kind of professional development might not directly link with the current uh, methodologies and professional developments that teachers are doing currently. So teachers need to work towards integrating it mindfully and develop you know, uh, maker pedagogies that are uh, compatible with this kind of, uh, of activities. Mm -hmm.